Enoch Soames by Max Beerbohm. Dramatised by Eric Pringle. Poor Soames. Had his gifts, such as they were, been acknowledged in his lifetime, he would never have made that strange bargain, whose results have kept him always in my memory. Yet it is from those results that the full piteousness of him glares out. And there lies his claim to... One can hardly call it fame. It was in the summer of 1893 that a bolt from the Parisian Blue flashed down on Oxford. Will Rothenstein had been commissioned by the Bodley Head to execute a series of 24 portraits in lithograph. He was 21. When he had polished off his selection of dons, he included a few privileged students, and out of my sitting for him there arose a friendship that has grown warmer with every passing year. And when, at the end of term, Rothenstein settled meteorically into London, through him I was introduced to that haunt of intellect and daring, the domino room of the Café Royal. There, in the hour before dinner on an October evening, drinking vermouth in that exuberant vista of gilding and velvet, I drew a deep breath and said, This, indeed, is life. Indeed, it is, Beerbohm. I say, Rothenstein, I haven't realised quite how famous you are. Hmm? Men are pointing you out to their friends. Yes. One of them is trying to catch your eye. He's passed our table twice. Did you not see him? A stooping, shambling fellow. Tall, very pale, longish, brownish hair. Yes, and a thin beard. <laughs> Hardly a beard. More a chin on which a number of hairs weakly cluster to cover its retreat. <laughs> <laughs> you know him. Well, I'd say he's a writer striving to look distinct in a black clerical hat which is intended to be bohemian and a grey cape which fails to be romantic because it's waterproof. He hasn't <laughs> changed. He looks extraordinarily dim. My dear fellow, he doesn't exist. Oh, then his ghost is coming over. You don't remember me? Yes, I do. Edwin Soames. Enoch Soames. Oh. Enoch Soames. We met two or three times at the Café Grosch in Paris. Yes. <laughs> well, will you have something to drink? Uh, this is Max Beerbohm. We're having... Absinthe for me. I have surrendered myself to its charms. Oh, but absinthe is bad for you. Nothing is bad for one. In this world, there is nothing good and nothing bad, as I explained in the preface to Negations. Negations? My book. I gave you a copy of it. Ah, yes. It must be wonderful to have written a book, Mr. Soames. It is. I have written another. It will be out soon. Really? What kind will it be? My poems. Is that its title? I rather thought of giving it no title. If a book is good in itself, there is no need. No title? Mightn't that be bad for sales? But suppose I went into a bookseller's and said simply, have you got, uh, or have you a copy of, um... How would they know what I wanted? I should have my name on the cover. And I rather want to have a drawing of myself as the frontispiece. Mm. I thought you, Rothenstein, well, might... a capital idea, Soames, except I'm going into the country tomorrow. I'll be there for some time. Oh. And now, heavens, is that the time? Come away, Beerbohm. We must rush. Goodbye, Soames. Uh, oh, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> goodbye, Mr. Soames. I say, Rothenstein, why were you so determined not to draw him? How can one draw a man who doesn't exist? I bought negations when I returned to Oxford. Eager to form my own judgment of an author I'd actually met face to face, I settled down and opened the preface. Lean near to life. Lean very near, nearer. Life is web, and therein nor warp nor woof is, but web only. It is for this I am Catholic in church and in thought. Yet do not let swift mood weave there what the shuttle of mood wills. What was that about? What was any of it about? There was a great variety of form, but the substance eluded me. I wondered for a moment whether there was any substance, even whether Enoch Soames might be a fool. But I supposed I must be the fool, and awaited his poems with an open mind. Soames himself gave me a foretaste one evening in January. I came across him in the domino room, 
reading. Mr. Soames, am I interrupting? I prefer to be interrupted. Sit down, beer bum. Uh, Absinthe? Uh, oh, no, thank you. Do you often read here? I, I should have thought the noise. I read second-rate things here. Shelley? The noise break. breaks up his deadly evenness. <laughs> but Milton. I read Milton in the reading room of the British Museum. Do you really? I have rooms round the corner and go there every day. Milton had a dark insight. It was Milton who converted me to diabolism. You, um, worship the devil? It's more a matter of trusting and encouraging. But I rather thought you were a Catholic. I'm a Catholic diabolist. Good Lord. You really should try, Absinthe. Isn't this a terrible country? Not a decent poet from Milton till now. Now? My poems are to be published next week. I found a title. Fungoids. Fungoids? Fungoids suggests something of their quality. Strange growths, natural and wild, yet exquisite and many-hued and full of poisons. Fascinating. I can't wait to read them. I will honour you with a sample. To a young woman. Thou art who hast not been. Pale tunes irresolute and traceries of old sounds blown from a rotted flute mingle with noise of cymbals rouged with rust nor not strange forms and epicene lie bleeding in the dust being wounded with wounds for this it is that is thy counterpart of age-long mockeries thou hast not been nor art well even now if one doesn't try to make sense of it and reads it just for the sound, there is a certain grace of cadence. Oddly enough, when I first read Fungoids, I thought the diabolistic side of him was the best. Diabolism seemed then to be a cheerful, even wholesome influence in his life. The first stanza of Nocturne, for example. Round and round the shuttered square I strolled with the devil's arm in mine. No sound but the scrape of his hoofs was there and the ring of his laughter and mine. We had drunk black wine. I liked the rollicking note of companionship. Now, though, in the light of what befell, none of his poems depresses me so much as this. Are you warm enough, Rothenstein? Yes, thanks. Oh, I'm decidedly warmer than Soames' reviewers. They fall into two classes. The ones who have little to say about his poems and those who say nothing at all. There are more of those. The publisher's advertisement quoted the Preston Telegraph. Um, it, it strikes a note of modernity throughout. These tripping numbers... Soames is a Preston man. Are you saying... Has he no talent? He doesn't need talent. He's the son of an unsuccessful, deceased Preston bookseller with an income of £300 from an aunt. And no surviving relatives, so he's all right. Well, materially, perhaps. But don't you think there's a spiritual pathos about him? No. Well, uh, I think Soames is rather a tragic figure. One of these days he'll die for want of recognition. Don't be so melodramatic. And don't try to get credit for a kind heart you don't possess. You're just like the rest of us. Perhaps I was... Certainly, when Soames brought out a third book in the autumn of 1896, his last book, published at his own expense, I meant but forgot to buy it. And I'm ashamed to say I don't even remember what it was called. Poor Soames. The next time I saw him was a few weeks later, at the private view of the New English Art Club. He was standing close to a pastel portrait of Enoch Soames, Esquire. It was very like him and very like Rothenstein to have done it. So, what a wonderful likeness. Yes. <laughs> we'll create a stir, as I'm sure Fungoid's created. I bought a copy. You're one of the three, are you? <laughs> three. You don't suppose I care, do you? No, of course not. I'm an artist, not a tradesman. Exactly so. And any artist who has given truly new and great things to the world has always had to wait long for recognition. I don't care a sou for recognition. Ah, I understand. You mean the act of creation is its own reward. Do I? 
So, perhaps Soames was not, after all, hoping for recognition by standing near his portrait all through the afternoon. Though for once an expression of faint happiness lit his countenance, for fame had breathed on him. Now, looking back, I regard the exhibition's close as having been virtually the close of his career. He had felt the breath of fame on his cheek, and at its withdrawal he gave in, gave up, gave out. He lost his desire to impress and became a plain, unvarnished Preston man, addicted to absinthe. I didn't see him again until the first week of June, when I took lunch at the Vantiem, a once popular literary restaurant in Soho. There were only two other customers when I arrived. One was Soames, looking haggard and ghastly in his hat and cape. The other was his antithesis, a tall, flashy, keenly vital man, wearing a waxed moustache, a fixed smile, and the most extraordinary scarlet waistcoat. I'd seen him before in the domino room at the Café Royal, and thought he took rather an interest in Soames. But he was ignoring him now, ordering lunch at his table in fluent, though not native, French. Soames! Now, this is a surprise. Uh, may I join you? <clears throat> ah, these jubilee preparations are making London quite impossible, don't you think? Soames? Oh, I've seen that fellow at the Café Royal. He was watching you. There's something sinister about him. His eyes are too close together. And that whisker makes him look like a conjurer. You can tell Bert doesn't like him. Oh, good afternoon, monsieur. Would you like to order? Um, an omelette, Bert, thank you. Uh, uh, and coffee. Very well, monsieur. Who lost your voice, Soames? A hundred years hence. No, we shan't be here. We shan't, no. But the museum will be where it is. And the reading room just where it is. And people will be able to go and read there. Well, I suppose they will, but uh, what... You think I haven't minded, don't you? Minded what, Soames? Neglect. Failure. Failure? <laughs> Neglect, perhaps, but, but failure? Certainly you haven't been appreciated. But then any artist who gives... Who gives truly new and great things to the world has always to wait for recognition. How do you know I was going to say that? You said it when Fungoids was published. I've never forgotten it because it's a true thing. It's a horrible truth. Well, perhaps... I told you then I didn't care a sou for recognition and you believed me. You thought I was above that sort of thing. You are, aren't you? You're shallow, beer bone. What would you know of the feelings of a man like me? You imagine that a great artist's faith in himself and in the verdict of posterity is enough to keep him happy? Posterity? What use is it to me? A dead man doesn't know that people are visiting his grave or unveiling statues of him. A dead man can't read the books that are written about him, but a hundred years hence, think of it. Yes? If I could come back to life then, just for a few hours, and go to the reading room in the British Museum and read the books that are going to be written about me, or better still, if I could be projected there now, this moment, just for this one afternoon, I'd sell myself body and soul to the devil for that. <coughs> Think of the pages and pages of entries about me I'll find in the catalogue. Soames, Enoch, endlessly. Endless editions, commentaries, biographies. Excuse, permit me, I have been unable not to hear your conversation. I wonder... Might I take a liberty and cut in? Oh, why not? You wish the bill, monsieur? At nine, I do not. Uh, Mr. Soames, Mr. Pierbaum. How do you know our names? Uh, though not an Englishman, I know my London well. Uh, of course, you are wondering who I am. I am the devil. <laughs> Mr. Pierbon? <laughs> the devil? Oh, dear. A curious <laughs> mitvar, Mr. Soames. How oh, there is a type of person to whom the very mention of my name is oh, so awfully funny. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, forgive me. Mr. Soames, <clears throat> I would discuss your proposal. Proposal? Uh, your wish uh, to travel. A hundred years? Travel? But how? I am a businessman, Mr. Soames. I like to do things immediately right now. Uh, you are a poet and 
detest business. Nevertheless, you will deal with me, eh? What you said just now gives me furiously to hope. Go on. Uh, now, Soames. It will be more pleasant, our little deal, because you are, I mistake not, a diabolist. A Catholic diabolist? A Catholic or not, you wish this afternoon to visit the reading room of the British Museum of a hundred years hence. Yes? Yes, but how... Uh... In return, you will sell yourself to me, body and soul. Yes, body and soul. Soames, be careful. Ah, Femo. What is time? An illusion. Past and future, just around the corner. I switch you on to any date. I project you... Poof! Poof? You wish to be in the reading room just as it will be on the afternoon of June 3rd, 1997. You wish to find yourself standing just past the swing doors this very minute. And that? Am I right? Yes, this is mad. Be quiet. It is now... Ten past two. At seven o'clock this evening, poof, you will find yourself again here, sitting at this table, and I will come and fetch you. On my way home. All right. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> I think not. Understand, Mr. Soames. As soon as I touch your arm, you will disappear from this world and appear in 1997. Now you are ready, yes? I'm ready. Very well. See, I touch. No, Soames, for pity's sake, can't you? He's gone. What did you expect? Oh, very clever, but hardly original for a conjurer or even an author. The Time Machine is a delightful book, isn't it? You are pleased to sneer, but, senor, it is one thing to write about an impossible machine and quite another to be a supernatural power. Mr. Soames is coming back? At seven o'clock this evening. Will you keep this table for him, Bert? Excuse me. Some fresh air! I felt giddy. Everything was unreal. I have only the haziest recollection of what I did and where I wandered in the glaring sunshine of that endless afternoon. Was there no way of saving Soames? A bargain was a bargain, but poor Soames. It seemed uncanny that he was at this moment living in the last decade of the next century, and uncannier still that tonight he would be in hell. Assuredly, truth was stranger than fiction. Oh, how intolerable was the strain of the slow-passing minutes of that empty afternoon. I was back at the Vingtième long before seven o'clock, at the same table. Bonsoir, monsieur. Que voulez-vous? Oh, um, nothing yet, Bert. I'll um, wait for Mr. Soames. Oui, monsieur. Uh, waiting, I read my evening paper, nervously holding its full width across my face, as if it could hide me from... Holmes, is that you? Oh, thank God. Are you all right? Bonsoir, monsieur. Uh, what shall we have to eat? Not speaking again, Soames? Il est souffrant, ce pauvre monsieur Soames. Uh, he's um, uh, tired, uh, Bert. Uh, uh, bring us some burgundy, will you? And uh, whatever food is ready. And, and the wine immediately, please. Oui, monsieur. You look depressed, Soames. Was it a disappointment? Mm. Oh, don't be discouraged. Perhaps it's only that you didn't leave enough time. Maybe two, three centuries hence, your work may... Yes, I thought of that. Well, then. Now, we must talk seriously. Where are you going to hide? Hide? You could catch the Paris Express from Charing Cross. You'll have an hour to spare. But don't go on to Paris. Stop at Calais. Live in Calais. He'd never think of looking for you in Calais. It's like my luck to spend my last hours on earth with an ass. Oh, thank you, Soames. Look, pull yourself together. This isn't merely a matter of life and death, it's a question of eternal torment. You're not going to wait limply here until the devil comes to fetch you, are you? I can't do anything else. I've no choice. <sighs> Your burgundy, monsieur. Oh, uh, très bon, Bert. Uh, look, have a drink, Soames. A votre santé, monsieur. Uh, no, no, no. Come on. Uh, and this attitude of yours is diabolism run mad. 
Surely now you've seen the brute. It's no good abusing him. Well, he's nothing like Satan in Paradise Lost, is he? I don't say he's not rather different from what I expected. He's vulgar. He's the sort of man who hangs about the corridors of trains, going to the Riviera and steals ladies' jewel cases. Imagine eternal torment presided over by him. You don't suppose I look forward to it? Well, then why not slip quietly out of the way? Have some more wine. Oh, Soames, wouldn't anything be better than this passive, meek, miserable waiting? And don't you think you ought to make some show of resistance for the honour of the human race? Why should I? What has the human race ever done for me? Be a bum. Can't you get it into your head that I'm in his power? You saw him touch me, didn't you? Well, there's an end to it. I've no will of my own now. I'm sealed. Sealed. Oh, it's the wine, isn't it? Sealed. That's my fault. I've been filling your glass and you haven't eaten. Look, take some bread at least. I don't want it. Well, tell me what happened. How was it all yonder? Tell me your adventures. They'd make first-rate copy, wouldn't they? Oh, look, Soames! I'm awfully sorry for you, and I make all possible allowances, but what earthly right have you to insinuate that I should make copy out of you? I don't know. I had some reason. I'll try to remember. I'll try to remember everything. Eat some bread. Have some more wine. Now, now, what did the reading room look like? Um, much as usual. Many people there? Usual sort of number. Well, what did they look like? They looked, uh, very like one another. What? All dressed alike? Uh, yes, greyish, yellowish stuff. Like a uniform with a number? Yes. Good Lord. And were all of them looking very well cared for, very utopian, smelling of carbolic, and all of them hairless? Yes, I think so. <sighs> Except I'm not sure about hairless. Uh, the hair might have been cut short. <laughs> I hadn't time to look at them very closely because... Uh, yes? They stared at me. I can tell you, I attracted a great deal of attention. It was almost as if they had been expecting me. I think I rather scared them. They moved away when I came near, but followed me about at a distance wherever I went. Strange. What did you do when you arrived? Went straight to the catalogue. I stared at the volume SN to SOF for ages, but uh, I couldn't take it down. My heart was beating so. And when you did? And when I did... Just brief entries for negations and fungoids, nothing else. No biographies, no critical works, nothing. Oh, so. At first I wasn't disappointed, because I thought there must be some new arrangement. I went to the round desk in the middle to ask where the catalogue of 20th century books was kept. The men at the desk seemed to have a sort of panic when I approached. And? They said there was still only one catalogue. So I knew I'd never be famous. But then, I wondered if there might be something about me in the histories of literature. So I asked for the best modern book on late 19th century literature. They brought me T.K. Nupton's, written in 1992. That's what I'd forgotten. It was on a piece of paper. What piece of paper? Here it is, um... Nupton's book wasn't easy reading, phonetic spelling. All the modern books I saw were phonetic, but proper names were spelt in the old way. That's how I noticed my name. You did? Your own name? Oh, I'm so glad. And yours. No. I thought I'd find you here tonight, so I copied out the passage. There, read it. But this is gibberish. Read it, Beerbohm. It's easier if you murmur the words aloud. Go on. Oh, very well. <clears throat> um, for example, a writer of the time named Max Beerbohm, who was still alive in the 20th century, wrote a story in which he portrayed an imaginary character called Enoch Soames. Imaginary? Imaginary. Go on, it gets worse. Um, Enoch Soames. A third-rate poet who believes himself a great genius and makes a bargain with the devil in order to know what posterity thinks of him. It is a somewhat labad labad labad? Labad, you ask! Get on with it! Oh, a somewhat uh, laboured uh, satire, but not without value as showing how seriously the young men of the 1890s took themselves. Well... Well... I don't know what to say. 
I'm quite bewildered. Oh, this is a, a nightmare. I mean, however my character might deteriorate, I would never be such a brute as to... It isn't a nightmare. It's real. I'm real. Here I am. Do I look imaginary? Well, of course not. It's all very baffling. If if you copied this out correctly, it's Nupton who must have made... is going to make some idiotic mistake. You aren't an artist! An artist imagines a thing and makes it seem true. You are so hopelessly not an artist, you're going to make a true thing seem as if you've made it up. You're a miserable bungler and it's like my luck. I'm not the bungler. Uh, not going to be the bungler. Nupton is the... will be... You can't even get your tenses right! And you're going to make me seem like a figment of your imagination. Now, look here. <gasps> what is it, Soames? It's... it's not... is it? Already? By Jove. Look at the way he's twisting his moustache. He looks like the villain in a melodrama. You can't take him seriously. C come in! Come in! I'm sorry to break up your pleasant party. You don't! You complete it! Mr. Soames and I want to have a little word with you. Please sit down. Now, listen. My friend got nothing by his journey this afternoon. The whole thing turned out to be a swindle, so the bargain is off. 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 I think not. I fulfilled my part of it. And now Mr. Soames must... Come, Mr. Soames. All right. Don't be in such a hurry. Well, I, I agree. Mr. Soames may have only himself to blame. And vanity should be chastened. Well, there's no need to be vindictive. You must have known he would gain nothing by his journey, so the whole thing was a very shabby trick. Soames. I'm coming. Wait, Soames. There. You fiend. Ah! Knives, Leobon, what can you do with... Cross them? knives! The sign of the... Oh, run, man, for pity's sake! Oh, can I? You are not superstitious, Mr. Leobon. Not at all. Soames, put those knives straight. Don't touch them! Mr. Soames is a Catholic diabolist. Put them straight. Don't! Defy him! I cannot. I must do as he... <laughs> Uh, uh, ah. Thank you, Mr. Soames. And now you will play your part. Come. Excuse me, Beerbaum. Oh, Soames. Out you go. Beerbaum, try to make them know that I did exist. Soames. Soames! <laughs> I never went to the Vantiem again. For a while I was troubled about what to do, for there might be a hue and cry, mysterious disappearance of an author and all that. But Soames's disappearance made no stir at all. He was utterly forgotten, except by me, before anyone noticed that he was no longer hanging around. And yet, on the afternoon of June the 3rd, 1997, in the reading room of the British Museum, there Soames will be. Everything will be precisely as he described. The fact that people are going to stare and follow him around and seem afraid of him can be explained only on the hypothesis that they will somehow have been prepared for his ghostly visitation. Look at your calendar. Do you see the date? Soames will be there now, won't he? At this very moment, looking up S.O. in the catalogue. He will remain until seven. If you hurry, you'll catch him. But keep your distance. For remember, he's been with the devil for a hundred years. And to the devil, he is going. Poor Soames. <laughs> In Enoch Soames by Max Beerbohm, dramatised by Eric Pringle, Nigel Anthony was Beerbohm, David Bannerman, Soames, Johan Meredith, The Devil, Christopher Wright, Rothenstein, and Rachel Atkins, Bertha. The director was David Blount.
At 8.15 tonight on Radio 3, David Benedictus and Tom Brown discuss the Enoch Holmes phenomenon in The Ghost in the Reading Room when they consider the story and its view of literary London.